Thanks everyone for coming uh, this evening. My name is Andrew Reed. I work for AVG. I uh, was one of the uh, ones that helped put on the event today along with uh, Judith and Marcella and uh, a few others that helped put this event together. I'll be the MC for the night. Uh, my hope today is just to get everyone a, a little better idea of AVG's interest in the cryptocurrency 2.0 space. Uh, give Vitalik a little bit of time to talk about Ethereum and where he sees that project going. Uh, along with some of the security issues in that and in Bitcoin. Uh, so with that intro, let me start with Todd Simpson, our uh, Chief Strategy Officer. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you all for uh, making the trek into our basement. I got to say, the, uh, the, it doesn't usually look this good down here. <laughs> looks, really, looks really good today. So um, you know, why would ABG be interested in uh, cryptocurrencies? It uh, might be obvious, but I'm going to explain it anyway. Um, if, you, as, if you're as old as me, you probably remember the first time that you had the capability to carry out a transaction on the web, right? And because we're in the tech field, we all knew we had to go in and check two things before we hit enter with our credit card, right? We checked, number one, that our client was safe, that you were running antivirus, and that you weren't, you know, being owned by somebody at that point in time. And then you check that the HTTPS uh, lock was on in the web browser. And then after you check those two things, you hit enter. Nothing bad happened. So then you called your mom and your sister and your dad. And you told them, hey, this web thing is actually pretty safe. You should try it. But you should probably check these two things before you uh, hit enter on your computer. right? And so uh, ABG and antivirus companies have actually been, I think, fundamental in encouraging uh, commerce and transactions on the web. And that's obviously something that we want to continue as we start to look at uh, the growth and evolution of cryptocurrencies. And so just that sort of fundamental trust that you have in your platform as the point where you're going to launch transactions, you know, whether that's your Bitcoin wallet or your, or your e-commerce, is really important. In fact, we're looking Further than that at ABG, right, where uh, if you've seen some of our recent announcements and what we've been doing lately, we launched a product called Zen at Mobile World Congress, which actually will go live next week. So please look it up and download it, and uh, it, it's awesome. But it starts to put sort of uh, the user's sense of safety and security foremost. So a little bit less about just the device and more about the entire environment that you're operating in and whether you feel safe and secure about what you're trying to do. Um, on the web. And so as we move from just device security to devices and data and people and making you feel good about what you're doing on the web, again, we hope we can help with the evolution of cryptocurrencies and getting the mainstream involved in cryptocurrency over, the, over a period of time. Because we all know it'll go through sort of that same hurdle of, oh my god, what am I doing? What is this digital money? Right? And so I think ABG can play an important role in that. So that was the, the basis, and, and Andrew, by the way, is our largest cryptocurrency uh, fan, as, as most of us know. Um, and then we happened to meet the guys from Ethereum, and uh, they had this sort of amazing idea of, you know, the blockchain doesn't have to just be a transaction record. It can be the transaction record and actually run code uh, to enforce or uh, enable contracts. And now suddenly you're running code inside of the cryptocurrency, you know, took, I had to read it twice, maybe three times <laughs> before it started to make sense to me. Um, but then it became obvious, you know, well, now you're running code and you have a, a running environment inside of your, your crypto environment, well, maybe there's more opportunities for uh, AVG and, and similar companies to, to play a part in ensuring that next abstraction layer is also a safe place and users feel comfortable you know, putting not only their currency up there, but some of their logic into this uh, distributed and federated environment. And so uh, we've had some great uh, talks with the Ethereum team and, and some brainstorming and are definitely intrigued by the entire space. But of course, I can't tell that story anywhere nearly as well as uh, Vitalik can. And so um, I'd like to introduce him and hand over the microphone and uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, well, so thank you to uh, Andrew and Todd and AVG for hosting a meetup. It's uh, definitely great seeing uh, uh, so many people interested. You know, the project is, I believe, just turning four months old just, just around today. So I, 
don't think don't think a lot of projects get uh, get to grow this this big so quickly. So it's definitely a, definitely a privilege to see to see so many people here. Yep. So uh, Ethereum, like uh, yeah, orig originally came up with the idea in uh, in late November, where and I where I've been working on this. Uh, Working in this space called the, called the cryptocurrency 2.0 space for uh, several months before then, and what got me interested about the cryptocurrency 2.0 space is people were th people were taking this idea behind Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain, and they were saying, is it possible to use the same underlying technology for more than just the currency? So, you know, the idea is actually quite old. You know, in 2010, people came up with this concept called Namecoin, which basically tries to do a DNS uh, decentralized inside of a blockchain. So for those who don't know what a DNS is, when you uh, type in google.com in your web browser, then what actually happens is that there are a set of servers called DNS servers which record what IP address google.com Google actually represents, and your computer queries the DNS servers, DNS servers reply back with the IP address, and then your computer actually fetches the web page from, the, you know, from that IP address. So people, you know, Namecoin guys saw this architecture and they realized, hey, why can't we just decentralize that? Why can't we take this uh, this database that's storing the IP address for every for every for the name of every single website, and why can't we put it onto a blockchain so the whole thing's distributed around the world, not not controlled by anyone, you know, potentially much much more efficient. And you know, I came up with this coin and rolled it out. You know, it's uh, been on the back burner for a few years, but you know, even now, just recently, there's a service called OneName.io that's based that's based on it. So that's based. You know, people are trying to use the technology, and they're realizing, you know, hey, if we're going to create like decentralized messaging applications, something like BitMessage, then if you, if you have a messaging application, then you need to have a name. And what good is a name if you know you your name is George, but someone else can also register an account that's called that's called George. You should be able to register the register a name and actually own it. So that's what blockchain is what you do. Then people came up with this concept of colored coins. Colored coins basically lets you issue all sorts of different digital assets on the blockchain. So say I'm I'm a big uh, gold storing company. I have 500,000 grams of gold. I can take I can release 500 I can take 500,000 satoshis, 500,000 tiny units of Bitcoin, and I can actually say each of these satoshis is worth one gram of gold. And I can and I can release those, and people can trade them just like they can trade regular bitcoins. Or you know, if you want current, you know, currency is just an abstraction. You can you can instead have a company release its shares on the blockchain. You could release sort of digital baseball cards on the blockchain. You could even have a token that represents something like a, something like a car or a house. So yeah, then people then there's this idea of master coin. You know, you can have all these assets on the blockchain. Why not have some simple types of contracts relating those assets? Automatic trades, decentralized exchange, financial contracts. So, back at the end of the at the end of the year, people were coming up with all sorts of different ideas of you know realizing the blockchain is so much more powerful than just Bitcoin. And people were thinking of decentralized exchange, financial contracts, name name coin, name registration, also various various kinds of derivatives, escrow savings wallets, and there were these coins coming out with a whole a whole laundry list of features. And that's when I realized. Well, if if you can have if people want coins that let them do twenty things, if people want coins that let them do forty things, why not make a coin that lets you do infinity things? A coin with a built-in programming language. Welcome to Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So since then, uh, we've obviously uh, gr uh, grown quite gr grown quite a lot. We've come, people have come up with a number of uh, very inter interesting ideas that you can do with Ethereum. So one of the ideas that I actually came up, came up with about a month ago that a, a lot of people have gotten very excited about is this uh, concept of a decentralized Dropbox. So you know, you have a 100 gigabyte file, you upload it onto a peer-to-peer -peer network, and you create a contract on the blockchain that says every hour, whoever can submit a proof that they, that, that there is still, that they still have a copy of the file can get one will automatically receive, say, one unit of Ether, or, in, or internal currency. And you, know, you can push this contract out into the wild, you know, preload it, and the, that contract all by itself, completely autonomously, will just incentivize people to hold on to your file for however many years you want. You know, Dropbox actually charges something like 100x markup on, on, the, on the stores that they provide, so potential for decreasing costs is massive. And on the other side, you, know, you, can now, or you will be able to earn money by renting out your hard drive. You know, sort of like we have Airbnb for renting out spare rooms in your house. 
will have decentralized Dropbox for renting out spare gigabytes in your hard drive. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Then there's all sorts of different ideas from the point of view of finance. So, for example, we actually figured out a way to use financial derivatives to basically rig up a currency, a, a cryptocurrency whose value would, whose value would cl end up closely tracking the U.S. dollar. So, you know, people are often scared of accepting Bitcoin because of volatility. And if you want to avoid volatility, well, you pretty much have to have your currency instantly con connect converted into money in your bank account. Well, here, well, guess what? You can have a cryptocurrency which uses which uses some automatic hedging on the back end, so that you accept a thousand dollars, and you know after thirty days you're still going to have a thousand dollars, as long as there's some speculators willing to, willing to take the other side of the trade. It just works. Escrow agreements. So people. So you know in the Bitcoin space, people are really worried about security. Right now, there's basically two ways to store your bitcoins. You can store your bitcoins yourself. So you can store them on your computer, store them on your phone, and I actually got a few. And there have been quite a few horror stories about that. So, uh, June uh, June 2011, a person on the Bitcoin Talk forum whose name is uh, Handle All in Vain, lose and posts a thread on the forum who said he says he lost 25,000 bitcoins. What happened? His wallet was on his desktop, unencrypted, and computer virus came along, stole him. Uh, June, <laughs> Uh, July 2011, St Stephen Thomas, pretty fa uh, famous Bitcoin developer, he did the opposite. He had lots of security. He had all his, he had all his Bitcoins in a, in a hardware encry encrypted USB key with with a password with like passwords written on paper and so forth. Three copies of, of his Bitcoins, forgot forgot the password to all of them. Seven thousand seven thousand Bitcoins are now sitting there, pretty much inaccessible on a hard drive, and and Stephen is still hoping that someday someone will be able to hack it. <laughs> 2012. Someone was someone was using a Bitcoin wallet on the desktop called Multibit. They and what happened then? How, this time, you know, they weren't stupid. They even put a pass password. They password protected the wallet, and Multibit ha actually had the ability to uh, encrypt encrypt the wallet file on the computer. It happened. Guess what? Guy downloaded a Java app. Ran the Java, uh, just thinking, you know, oh, whatever, it's some Java app, I'm supposed to download it. Ran it. Java, then, at some point, he decided, oh, I need to log into my Bitcoin wallet. Enter the password. Guess what? There was a keylogger. The keylogger, keylogged the password, opened up the wallet, 180 Bitcoins gone. So, those, that's just, just to say, you know, securing your Bitcoins is, by yourself, is a hard problem. Now, of course, there's the other approach. Well, I'm definitely too incompetent to secure Bitcoins on my own, so I'm just going to trust them all to a centralized service of people who, who very much know what they're doing and are professionals. Mount Gox. <laughs> so, idea here is that, you know, once again, security is hard. So, one of the nice things uh, about, about Ethereum is that there's actually, is that you can actually use smart contracts that's basically, that have mul multiple keys. So you control some, you control one key, some other party controls one key, and you can have withdrawal limits. So you can say you're allowed to withdraw, you're allowed to withdraw a maximum of one percent per day just by yourself with your key. If you want to withdraw more, then you have to go to the central service and you have to actually verify yourself and they'll co-sign the transaction, and and that'll let you empty out as much as you want. They by themselves can withdraw money, but they can only do it very slowly. So you know what happens if you lose your password? You go to them, they'll be able to recover the money. You've, your password gets hacked, well, you still have your copy, you and the central provider come together and you immediately load all the money into a new account. Central provider turns out to be malicious, well, they only got one key, they can't really do much. So these, are, so these sorts of more, more intricate, intricate smart contracts are really where a lot of the, a lot of the interest in Ethereum comes from. But yeah, so you know, what, what, where are we at now? So we've got our uh, alpha, alpha testnet client out, uh, Gav is uh, actually going to release uh, version four, I believe, uh, 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 pretty soon. So it's uh, it's a test net. You can run co you can run all these contracts. We have a really nice and easy to use programming language. You know, if if you can roll to write, if this happens, send fifty you know, send 50, fifty ether this address. All works pretty much like Python. It's uh, very easy to use. Uh, in fact, I actually saw at Coin Summit someone someone came up with an app for. With an app that basically uses sort of like a, one of those sort of Lego brick type graphical programming environments, where you can actually 
sort of drag and drop box blocks together, you can create contracts. So that's also another really cool thing. You know, we, uh, medium term goal. For, uh, you know, we have all these tools, but at some points, we want the average user to be actually using them. So we want to we want to get these tools into the into the hands of a large number of people, and we want to package them up in such a way that people don't necessarily need to even be thinking about the cryptographic magic that happens at the back end. Grandma's not going to be going, even in Python, grandma's not going to be writing contracts. So, <laughs> so what, we, what we've come up with is we've come up with, as you know, in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin client is, or, is just a wallet. In Ethereum, the Bitcoin client, or the Ethereum client is like, is like Android. It's this box where you, and it's an app store, and you, or it will be an app store, and you will be able to just down, download apps and just run apps. You know, you want your you want your secure multi secure multi party wallet, down, download the app, use it. You want your financial derivatives exchange, download it, use it. You want your you want your name coin, use it. So, and and the the idea is, you know, we we would like to see people come up come up with these sort of utilities that do, that are nice packaged up, nice and easy to use, and people just use them, and they don't even realize. That there, that there is, that there is all this trust-free cryptographic magic on the ba on the back end, ensuring that they're that they're completely safe. So, but at the same, but at the same time, you know, we are not going to be able to do this by ourselves. So, for, there's a, a, so there's a lot of security challenges in terms of securing the actual Ethereum client. So, Ethereum is a blockchain with a built-in Turing complete programming language. There have been environments with Turing complete programming languages before. We have uh, J JavaScript in the web browser, for example. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, you know, JavaScript in the web browser is obviously incredibly powerful. It lets you, you know, people have written Gmail on top of JavaScript. People have written Facebook on top of JavaScript. People have written Bitcoin wallets on top of JavaScript. And yet, at the same time, there are there are a lot of security issues or security issues rather singular. Uh, you know, there's uh, remote code execution. There's what happened, especially in the client side Bitcoin scene. You know, what happens if the code that you're running isn't doing what you think it's doing. You know, people aren't going to necessarily be able to be able to look at a financial derivatives contract and, and tell whether or not it's legitimate on their own. So that's one of the things that we are that we are looking for some third parties to do. Basically, an app. Basically, we want to have an app store with some kind of built-in vetting system. So if someone makes someone makes an app to do, to say make, do some some kind of financial derivative, we want. We want we want people cert certifying the contract, certifying certifying the app, to make sure that that contract is doing what it says it's doing, to make sure that it's it doesn't have some some, some really clever secret backdoor in it. And, uh, then, if it, in, and you know, the, it's not even just about whether the contract itself has a back backdoor in it. At the same at the same time, you know, it's, for a decentralized Dropbox, that's that's an application that has to talk to your hard drive. So. You know that's sort of a that sort of gets into the territory where you're actually escaping the sandbox, and, you, and the application's code would have to be able to look into your hard drive, access files, edit files, modify files. There's there are obvious security is issues around that. We want to try and figure out a really good a really good model that will let you that will let you sandbox that. In the same way, Android has has you has every application declare exactly what it's going to do. This app is this app is going to potentially send text messages is going to potentially use system system storage give permission you know make some, make something easy to use and then it encourages applications to ask for only what they need and basically really come up we want to make sure that people that people can be empowered with all the tools that can be built on top of our platform but without giving the but without giving malicious tools the power the power to wreak havoc on the user's desktop then there's also obviously implementation challenges We've got once again blockchain built-in pro built-in programming language. And what do, what if there's some some vulnerability in the in the interpreter? That's uh, one area where you know our at this point our best our best defense is simplicity. We have an instruction so we have an instruction set of 50 instructions. That's all that's all you need. Those instructions have no way of accessing cloud storage. They have no way of they have no way of access of uh, accessing the internet. You know, even there, we want to do we want to do our due diligence. We want to make sure, we want to make sure the client is rock solid. Then, once we get into applications, you know, application applications, they those can can potentially access access your file storage. You know, once once we start getting out of the sandbox of just pure 
stuff. Well, no, what what everything that's in Ethereum stays in Ethereum and start getting out, getting into this concept of actually interacting between the blockchain and the world. So that's um, potentially getting getting into some very interesting territory there. So you know, the, like in the long term, I think that. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these tools have a lot of potential. Especially, like one of the areas that people are very excited about is actually con just various different monetization strategies. So I know a lot of people these days are excited about this concept of you know using coins to mo to monetize yourself. So or to monet really to monetize almost anything. So here is just uh, one example: monetize monetizing software. If you're if you're releasing if you want to release some kind of freeware and you want people to use it without use it without paying for it but still still earn some money, you could potentially you know put in a put in a miner into the software and you can mine mine cryptocurrencies. Ethereum might let you do that. Alternatively, you know decentralized Dropbox. Once again, you can earn money with your with your hard drive. You know, potentially using up all of all of these unused resources and really and really just dra drastically improving the efficiency of the entire, of the entire ecosystem. And then later, you know, later, let's see, later on, there's also just monetization. So one really interesting idea that I heard, actually, this was invented by a guy from in Texas called Donald Lumsden. So it's actually something really interesting. So what you do is take a BitTorrent network. Right now, you can use a BitTorrent network to share songs, share movies, share books. Now, add an, add an incentivization layer. So add the ability to actually pay for downloading packets. So, you know, one of the problems with BitTorrent is that there's, there's never enough people seating. If there's some really popular movie, then there's always enough people seating. But if there's something less popular, then quite often you can't find it. And this actually sort of creates a perverse effect, right? Because you have this decentralized network, but at the same time, it's actually encouraging centralization of culture. Harry Potter is easy to get, but, so but something that's potentially a bit more obscure and a bit less well marketed, can't get it. Now, that's one step. Here's the second step, though. Just, you know, bits weren't paid by itself. Okay, whatever, you have a better file sharing system. The real fun part comes when you can actually use the technology to make sure the artists themselves get rewarded. So here's, the, here's what Donald Lumsden came up with. Every single, for every single, single file that gets uploaded to the system, create a new currency. And then the network, the network for, uh, for sharing packets of that file require, requires you to pay in that currency. So if you want to, down, if you want to download packets, then you have to actually use, that, use the currency associated with the file to pay for it. And if you want to upload the packets, then you can earn that currency. And the way the artists make money is, when you, when you publish the file, you get, a huge number of, you get a huge number of currency units just for yourself by default. So idea is, you know, the more people, start, the more people down, download your song or your movie, the, the value of the currency just naturally goes up because there's a larger market, a larger market for, for, for download, downloading these packets. And then you've got these currency units and you, and you can sell them. You know, nobody's actually pay nobody's paying for nobody's paying for your for nobody's paying you for the f for for your content, and yet at the same time you're getting this sort of extra magic money coming out of nowhere. That's the sort of power of currencies, right? It's the sort of, like Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoins are worth eight billion dollars. Where did that eight billion dollars come from? You know, sure people people bought people bought it, but and people sold it, but the but the the value itself, like it's not, it's not really backed by backed by anything. It's just, it's just magically floating. And a lot of these currencies, like R Ripple, one and a half billion dollars. I'm not even sure if there's been a, a one and a half billion dollars of billion dollars of trade of XRP. It's a sort of really interesting financial multiplier effect. So, the conclusion is basically that there are this concept of of currencies and this concept of, di of digital consensus, digital consensus networks, and this concept of contracts really opens up a lot of possibilities. And at the same time, there's also a lot of challenges, and those challenges have to do with things like securing it and real, and really pack taking these tools and packaging them up into some into something that ordinary people can actually use. And that's, I think, something that, I, that we can all work together on. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take questions. Yeah? yeah. Questions? Um, I, I like that idea about monetizing like uh, intellectual property, um, but one thing that seems worrying about that idea to me is uh, it seems like you're saying that the person that first uploads the file has the most potential to benefit. Um, but in practice, it seems likely that the first person to upload files, even after this thing becomes popular, 
will be the first hacker to get hold of that intellectual property and then benefit tons. So it kind of will promote like increased incentives for people to steal intellectual property. And even if artists would want to use this, they're probably not going to be allowed to because of the IP laws imposed by the publishers. So like that's yeah, quite a right. Yeah. Yeah, well, the ultimate I, well, the ultimate goal is for the artists themselves to be the first to be the first to upload it. Yeah, I think obviously this is not the sort of thing that a lot of people are a lot of people are going to jump onto, and uh, whatever the whatever the implementation is, it'll probably ha it'll probably have to fil filter out pirated stuff at first. But like, like later on, yeah, exactly. Yep, you know that's yeah, perfect perfect solution. You know, sign it with. Uh, yeah. Wait, so by signing, who signs the artist? The artist signs it. Yeah, artist signs it. So the association was between artist and, I guess, like a signing key. And then you say, oh, this is an unverified form. Therefore, you should Therefore, it's bad. Yeah. New business teaching artists about crypto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it seems plausible that the tech savvy artists will be able to benefit from this and therefore they'll be promoting for more artists to want to use it. Exactly. So, uh, we're. <laughs> So that was a very interesting example you gave. Uh, so you, I think you know about LTB coin that we're doing. So that's phase two. <laughs> phase one is just create a different asset for each piece of content that comes out. Issue that as shares through, right now we're using counterparty, but that's what I wanted to ask you is, when can we build phase two on Ethereum? Because the other thing I want to do with it is I want to have a localized Dropbox for our network where we're able to essentially outsource the hosting for all the content we're creating to our listeners, because we already have people who want to do that. But people want to earn our currency, and like we're coming up, you know, we're doing proof of tipping, proof of commenting, proof of sharing, and all these other things. But I'd really like proof of distribution, and I think that I can only do that with Ethereum, right? Yep. Uh, what is LTB coin? <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Uh, LTB coin is the network currency of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, which is the show that I started doing uh, about a year ago, and then uh, six months ago. Sorry. And then about uh, six months ago, we, sorry, not six months ago, about two months ago, we added uh, five new shows to the network, and we're going to add another five new shows. So we went from two hours original Bitcoin content per week up to, uh, you know, we're going to go to 12. Um, and, uh, but what I discovered is that uh, it's very, very difficult to, um, to vest people in a project early. And so if you use Bitcoin like we do, then that, that was kind of easy early on. But it's gotten actually harder over time because people are less okay giving it away for content that they perceive to be free. So what you can do is just like Dogecoin has created this sort of environment where who cares if you give someone a thousand Dogecoin? It's no money anyways. Over time, it might be. I mean, like, again, they have a kind of inflationary currency, but LTB is being designed with a five-year deflationary curve that is going to essentially make it so that for people who get into our network in the first two years, both on the audience side and on the content creation side, are really, really, really going to benefit just like the early miners did for Bitcoin. So I think that it's really, again, like these, these tokenization schemes are a great way to incentivize anything. I mean, that's really it is. Figure out what the value is in your network, apply it to your problem, and you can incentivize whatever it is you need people to do. That's what we're doing. Yeah, it's, uh, just in general, I think I, the, what I like about this concept of a coin is that it creates this really interesting new sort of business model dynamic. It's sort of between a for-profit, almost something between a for-profit and a non-profit. Because what you end up doing is you end up creating your currency, which is somehow represents some intrinsic asset inside of your network, and then you distribute that currency really widely. And what you do, what this ends up creating is a sort of social contract effect where you have a, you, you have a huge number of people in the community who are basically in, incentivized with, with coins to actually do what they can to, to support your project. Yeah. Mentioned, the reason why our coin has value is because you can use it. The only thing you can buy advertising or sponsor time from us with starting in two weeks from now, once we roll it out. Uh, can you speak on uh, what's going on with Dagger or the follow-up to Dagger right now? Uh, how development with that is going? Sure. So uh, just as a bit of an introduction, Dagger is a yeah, mining algorithm I invented, which uh, tried to be basically extremely memory hard. So you have uh, Bitcoin's mining algorithm is uh, SHA-256. Script improved on that by basically coming up with an algorithm that requires not just a lot of computation time, but also a medium amount of memory, 128 kilobytes. And uh, 
But from there, so the argument there is that it's harder to create specialized hardware or ASICs for it because you also need a whole, a whole bunch of memory, and memory is something that's pretty much commoditized. But so the problem is, though, is that people are coming up with ASICs for script already. So script mining is uh, it's memory hard to do, but it's also memory hard to verify. So if you go up to a 20 megabyte script, then you actually need something like two to five seconds to verify a block, which is just way too long to be practical. So with Digger, I came up uh, with this original idea that uses this mathematical concept of direct, direct eddy cyclic graphs to create a proof of work which is memory hard to do, but memory easy to verify. So as it turns out, uh, Dig Digger is uh, mathematically great, but it's... Uh, not per, but even though it's memory hard, it given it's not that good against uh, shared memory attacks. So where you have ASICs that have some uh, that have some amount of memory, some amount of memory, but that have a huge number of processors hooking into the same memory. So for at that point, we basically moved on and we decided to think, you know, go beyond memory hardness. How do we create an ASIC resistant proof of proof of work? And that's and that you can actually you actually have some strong assurances is actually secure. So the idea that we had is this: uh, basically, okay, you know, we have Ethereum, we have a built-in programming language. Why not use the programming language as the proof of work? So what we're saying is, let's have the proof of work computation be taking the blockchain, the blockchain, 16 blocks ago, picking a few random transactions from the last 16 blocks, adding on some some random code, and basically just running all of that code, and then seeing and then seeing if the if the output satisfies certain conditions. So the benefit for that is that if you want to make a miner, if, and if you want to make an ASIC miner for it, then you're basically creating is an ASIC miner that would end up computing computing Ethereum VM code. Guess what? An ASIC that can give the EVM code is Turing complete. If you can encode any computation in EVM code. So if you have an ASIC for EVM code, you can have an AC, you have an ASIC for general computation, aka a CPU. Yeah. So that's basically our our argument. Um, the de obviously, the devil is in the details. So the details are something that we're very he heavily fo uh, f going to be focusing on, on a a as time goes on. But that's uh, basically the, st the strategy that we're going that we're uh, trying to take at this point in terms of mining. Thank you. Yes. Um, so it's a it's a really interesting concept, and I'm I'm really excited about it actually. But I'm wondering about some of the specifics. Like when you upload a program or encode it into the blockchain, is that global for Ethereum everywhere? Every every person who runs Ethereum is going to get that program basically downloaded, sort of like Bitcoin is right now. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so is it at some point would it become a lot of storage or you know computation to sort of download all of that data and be running it all the time? Or how do you guys? What is the plan with that? Um, yeah, so we have a uh, we have a we're putting a lot of thought into into a computation into a system of transaction fees that would basically force people to be as lean as lean as possible. At the same time, you also have this optimization that's same with Ripple, where you don't actually need to store the entire blockchain history. What you come up with, you basically, the, every single block in the blockchain contains a copy of the, uh, contains the ledger, and so you can just dis discard all the old data, pretty all the old, old data, pretty much, pretty much immediately. So we've come up with a, a, a few tricks, and then on top, on top of that, we're that's really one of the areas that we're thinking of, that we're really trying to solve, basically. Like we've had several several different uh, different ideas. Like at this point, it seems like you know if Ethereum becomes as big as big as big as Bitcoin or or um, in terms of the amount of stuff that people do will do on it, you know maybe the state will grow to something like a, a gigabyte, but it could go to grow to ten gigabytes or a hundred gigabytes. So what we're um, really do uh, wants to so in terms of solutions we've come up with, uh, first of all, we've come up with a protocol that allows. Uh, a much smaller number of uh, so, so really the question is is that first of all in this kind of setup a lot of computers are not going to be able to mine but the problem is you know if it's too hard for people to mine and there's only say 20 20 computers in the entire world that are mining probably all owned by large companies and it's not really decentralized anymore so one one of our clever tricks is that our mining algorithm once again mining algorithm forces you to grab random transactions random data from the blockchain so that forces every every miner to be a full to be basically a full client second approach is that we've come up with uh, 
a cryptographic protocol that basically allows so-called light clients. So light clients are clients that basically only download and process part of the blockchain uh, uh, to be secure. It's the and uh, and the third thing that we're th that we're com coming up with is uh, this. We're, we're thinking of basically storing, uh, you know, sort of like an 80-20 rule or even a 90-10 rule. 10% 10 of the blockchain is probably used. 95 or 99 percent of the time, and then the other 90 percent of the blockchain is just dust. That's basically the pattern that you see in things in Bitcoin and Litecoin and just about in just about every coin. So what we're thinking of is what well, what if you can take all those all those tiny parts of the blockchain and store them on something like a distributed hash table, or and then storing just the five the five most common per, most common percent locally. So you have this sort of node that's a high that's a hybrid of a regular Bitcoin client and and yet off offloads a lot of functionality to the network. So I think, so the, and then finally we're looking at some, some uh, very poten potentially futuristic and crazy designs that involve having multiple blockchains. So basically we have a lot, a lot of these different, different ideas. We're realistically, we're probably even gonna, even gonna try them all in parallel and we'll just see what works. Any other point? So, did you actually answer my question? Yes. Um, the right. Date. Yeah. The date. Yes. So we are hoping for a launch end of summer or early fall. Right. So right n right now, as we mentioned, our client is in this proof of concept three, soon to be proof of concept four stage, where you can run contracts. We have an alpha client. It works. At this point, the next step is building up the user interface, making user interfa interface actually actually like good and beautiful, and letting be and creating in this client that people can build apps on top of. That'll be probably April or May. And heavy scalability uh, upgrades, heavy se heavy security testing, potentially more pro potentially more protocol updates, and then finally, when we get the clients to the well, when we get all three clients to the to C Go and Python to the point where we're bug where they're bug free, they're they're, they're scalable and they cl and they clearly all all work. Then that, and as soon as we're satisfied, we're going to end up launching the basically launching the Genesis block, which is when the main network will begin. So right now, if you download the client, it's just test ether, and it's not worth anything. But at, one, at some point, we're going to launch the main blockchain, launch the Genesis block, and you know that's when that's the point of no return. Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, we will be. Uh, so the way that the, that the organization is funding itself is that we are is that the Ethereum network has an internal currency called ether. Sort of similar to the XRP and Ripple, where the point of Ether is to serve as sort of the main liquidity layer of the platform, to serve as the as the the main currency to pay transaction fees in. And the idea is that we'll be selling units of the units of the currency, so you'll be able to buy 1,000 Ether for a Bitcoin or up to 2,000 up to 2,000 if you get in early. And that's something that will be starting in a couple of weeks, probably around the Toronto Bitcoin Expo Expo in April. Code execution. Is there going to be a trade -off code execution? Yes. Well, right. So the way that the network is regulated in general is basically there's a, a transaction fee that you pay per computational step. Well, there's a per computational step and per byte, uh, like byte of actual storage. I don't know how comparable it is, but do you think that Ethereum is going to wind up being more expensive to Bitcoin on a transactional basis? Um, I think so. Realistically, I think uh, we're going to put a lot of resources in development, and we'll make uh, transa uh, simple transactions cheaper. If you end up making like really co really complicated transactions that take up a lot of space and and do a lot of computation, then those might end up be being more expensive. Well, so you're doing everything on one blockchain. You yeah. mentioned the idea of parallelism, mm -hmm. and that's like something I've been wondering about a lot because it seems like the, the Ethereum network gets to be so big, it becomes a real problem where you just like mm -hmm. other Bitcoin. So yeah. that, like, are you thinking you know you've built one giant tree on the whole forest? Yeah, that's that's the multi-blockchain idea that I was talking about. Like that's the sort of thing that's still sort of in the science fiction stage. So, really, what we're thinking of actually is we're going to launch Ethereum 1.0. Ethereum 1.0 is going to be good enough, and then we have all these sort of advanced cryptography ideas, and we're trying to come up with do a large collaboration with a lot of different researchers, other Bitcoin people. And uh, when it's, once Ethereum 2.0 comes along, it'll integrate all sort of all, all these different ideas that are, that really p create like a. a like pretty much the ultimate world world class scalable cryptocurrency. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Vitalik. All right.
Thanks to everyone for coming tonight. We still have food in the back, so please make uh, yourself to the back. Let's mingle, and um, a lot of the AVG folks here as well, so please uh, come say hi to us. Thanks.